Good afternoon to everybody. I would, well, would like to welcome you to this uh, seminar. So today, as you see, we have a speaker, uh, Claudio Landin, and he's going to talk about uh, metastability from the point of view of large deviations. Claudio, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Pablo, for the invitation. So today we start an experiment. I will do my talk on the blackboard. I hope uh, you will be able to, to see and to follow. So uh, this is part of a project with uh, all these people which we've been working together on metastability. And to motivate what I'm going to talk, let me start with an example, with a model. So the model is uh, as simple as possible. So I'll take uh, a random walk on cubes of size n. So you fix an integer n, and you take cubes of size n. And okay, so maybe let's say that some of them are two-dimensional, the other ones are three-dimensional, and so on. So let me maybe here is a possible example. So let's say that these two are three-dimensional. And while these ones are two-dimensional, and say that this is three-dimensional and this is two-dimensional, just to fix ideas. And so these are cubes, n by n. Some of them are three-dimensional. Some of them are two-dimensional. And they are joined by a unique point. So there is a unique point, which is an intersection between this cube and this square. And this holds for all the other ones. And what I do is I consider a random walk uh, moving in this uh, space, so which I will represent, say, by x and t. So this random walk waits an exponential time of mean 1 at one point. And at the end of this point, it shows with uniform probability one of its neighbors, and it jumps there. So this is my, my process, x and t. And uh, let me represent it's a irreducible. It has a unique stationary state, which I will represent by pi n. And in our case, pi n is just proportional to the degree. So pi n of a point x will be proportional to the degree of x divided by a renormalizing constant, where the degree of x means the number of neighbors of uh, the point x in this graph. So this is uh, the model. and what are important here are uh, three quantities. The f well, let's say two quantities. The first one is uh, what's called the relaxation time. So if you look at a cube, uh, n by n cube in dimension d, and uh, you start from a point, you want to see how long you need to wait in order for your distribution to be close to the stationary state of uh, this object. So I won't really define what's relaxation time, but just uh, I guess you, you know what it is. And well, we know that in any dimension d larger or equal to well, 1, actually, the relaxation time is of order n square, which means that after a time of order n square, in this process, you forget the starting point. Since your distribution is very close to the stationary state, you essentially lost the information of your initial point after time n square. And then there is the heating time, which will be another important quantity, which is if you fix a point, it's the time it takes for you to visit that point. And this heating time well, will depend on the dimension. So in dimension 2, it's of size n square log n, while in dimension 3 or higher, it's of size n to the power d, which means that if you start, say, from uh, this square, what you will do is that, well, you will evolve along uh, this square. And after time n square, you are essentially uniformly distributed over this square. And now if you wait long enough, which means n square log n, you will finally hit this point. Once you hit this point, what you will do is you do s some short excursions on neighbors of this point until you reach a point which is inside, let's say, of this square. At that time, well, 
you weight again n square. After n square, you are uniformly distributed. And then you need to weight n square log n to hit one of these four points. And then you evolve. This means the following. If I give uh, a label to these cubes, so let's say that uh, this is cube 1, this is cube 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. You have to So, so your pattern, these, these square and cubes, and the way they are, they are glued together, it's fixed and only n varies? Exactly. OK. I have seven cubes, and uh, n will converge. It's a unique parameter. OK? So, uh, OK, so what I will do is I will define a function phi n from my state space, which I will represent by vn. So vn is the union of these cubes to uh, S, which will represent the set 1, 7, which are the labels of these cubes. And if I now observe phi n of x, n of t, well, what uh, you expect, it's exactly what I said. So let's say that if you start from uh, cube 1, which means that this is a square two-dimensional cube, so you will be uh, in one, in an order, n square log n. After this time, you will hit uh, this intersection point. At this intersection point, you might jump from 1 to 3, and from 3 to 1 in a very short time period. And at some point, you reach one point which is far from this intersection point. Let's say that you hit a point still in the square 1, and then you first relax, then you wait again n square log n until you hit again the intersection point. And maybe uh, at some point you will be in a, a cube, a square, which has a three-dimensional cube as a neighbor. And at that time, you will wait. You will have to wait something like n to the d, in which case here it's n cube in order to hit the intersection point. So this is the typical uh, behavior of, let me call Zn of t, the projection of our process x and t. Which means that if I observe this process in the time scale theta n, in which I take theta n to be n square log n, then these objects here becomes um, all the one intervals. And maybe I can uh, try to prove the convergence of this process z and t to some process z t. Okay. And this will be, uh, if I can prove that, will be a way in which I have a reduced um, model to the original process. So I'm describing the evolution of the original process by a much smaller mark of chain z t, which has a state space with seven points instead of that one, which has typically and uh, to the d points. Okay, so this is um, the model, and this is the typical um, type of theorem one would like to prove. So this is the model. So now let me talk about uh, large deviations. So let's say that we have now a fixed set v, and we have a Markov chain x t, which takes value in z t, and let me define what's called the empirical measure of uh, associated to this process, which is simply, well, you take delta of xs, so xs is the position at time s, delta, it's a d measure concentrated on that position, so this is a measure on v, and you integrated that from 0 to t, and you divide that by 1 over t. So this is uh, mt, it's a measure which uh, at x indicates the average time you spent at x in the time, time interval 0t. So this is an element of the space of probability measures over the set v. Okay. And let's say that this process is irreducible. Let me represent by pi its uh, stationary state. So what you, uh, the, the ergodic theorem tells you 
it's that mt will converge to pi as t goes to plus infinity. And one could ask about the large deviations of m. And this was uh, proved by Donsker and Varden in 75. So they proved that starting from any point x, the probability that mt is close to a measure mu. So you take a probability measure mu on v. And you ask, what is the probability that the empirical measure is close to the measure mu? Well, they proved that this is well a large deviation, so that this is exponentially small, with rate exponential minus t times large deviation rate function i of mu, which is known explicitly. So i of mu is just the supremum over all positive functions h of minus the integral of L, which is the generator of our Markov process x, LH divided by h d mu. Okay? So I of mu, it's measuring the cost needed to produce an empirical measure close to mu for this process. Okay? So this is um, the large deviation uh, theorem that Donskan and Varden proved in 75. Fine. So my problem here is uh, I fixed a space V. I consider a sequence now of Markov chain X and T. So the state space is fixed. And now uh, I have a family of Markov chains. And I will represent by R and X, Y the jump rates of this Markov chain. So we have uh, the large deviation theorem by Donsky and Varden, which tells me what is the cost of observing a specific empirical measure mu. So this is given by the supremum over h strictly positive of minus ln of h divided by h mu. And uh, my question is, well, assume that this process, this sequence of Markov chains, converge in the sense that assume that the rates converge to some Rxy. And what I would like to investigate is the asymptotic behavior of In of mu. For that, I will need uh, two facts. The first one about uh, I. So I of mu is equal to 0 if and only if mu is a stationary state of your Markov chain. And then that uh, I of mu is always finite. So I of mu is bounded by a constant which depends on the jump rates of R, whatever mu. Okay. So let me keep uh, this example. So it's conceivable, conceivable that if Rnxy is converging to Rxy, that the rate function i of n will converge to i of mu, where uh, i of mu will be represent the rate function associated to the rates r. And this for all mu in all measure mu. Okay. So this is uh, not difficult to prove. I, I want to show it to you. But my point is the following. So assume that the Markov chain xt, so let me represent by x of t the Markov chain uh, generated by these rates, assume that it is irreducible. Well, if it is irreducible, this means that i of mu is equal to 0 if and only if mu is the stationary state. And our analysis will stop here. But if this 
chain is reducible, so which means that if this Markov chain, let's say that, let me represent by V1, V2, and uh, V, let's say, M, the closed irreducible class, and let's say that here I have a set which are the transient points of my Markov chain XT. This means that, well, since this is a closed irreducible class, associated to this closed irreducible class, I have uh, these stationary states which whose su support are the sets V1, V2, Vm. Let me represent them by pi 1, pi 2, and pi m. This means that uh, by the result I told you, that I vanish at any stationary state, this means that if I take any convex combination of these stationary states pi j, this is a new stationary state, which means that i of this new measure it's equal to zero, right? And therefore, um, well, it's a natural question now to say that, well, since the rate function of these measures vanish, well, maybe I can find a sequence theta n, which is increasing to plus infinity, such that theta n i n mu will converge to a non-trivial limit. Okay? And this is the question. Okay? So uh, look for sequences theta n, which are converging to plus infinity, for which this limit won't be uh, trivial. So first, what is uh, theta n i n of mu? Well, as we have seen, we have a variational formula for i. So this is the supremum over all functions h, which are strictly positive, of minus ln h divided by h d mu. And since I'm multiplying that by theta n, there is a theta n here. So actually, theta n i n is the rate function associated to the new generator, which is the original one multiplied by theta n. This means that we are looking at the process speeded up by theta n. So we are looking at a new process, which is now uh, observed on the time scale theta n. And what we want is to find the time scale, the correct time scale theta n for which uh, this limit won't be um, trivial, won't vanish. And so let's recall that I'm representing by v1, vm. These are the closed irreducible classes of my chain xt. This means that if, um, if you start at v1, so that the jump rates from a point in v1 to a point which is not in v1 are 0. And since rn xy is converging to rxy, this means, well, that uh, for n sufficiently large, if you started from v1, you will remain in v1 for a long time, because the probability to jump from a point in v1 to a point outside v1, it's converging to 0. So let me define the transition times. So let me call uh, Tj and the transition time of this chain. This means that I'll take a point x in Vj, so in the closed irreducible class Vj. And I will compute what's, how long I need to wait until this process hits one of the other irreducible classes. So let me represent by h a the hitting time of a set a. So this is the infimum over all t positives, such that uh, x and t belongs to a. And let's take the union 
for k different from j of vk. Okay. So this is um, the expectation of the heating time of the set vk for k different from j, starting from a point x in vj. Well, the asymptotic behavior of this um, transition time, which I'm what I'm calling transition time, won't depend on x, because since v1 is a reducible class, or vj, starting from a point x, you'll, since you are speeding up time by theta n, you'll visit essentially all points in vj before you leave vj. So you can show that um, this transition time asymptotically does not depend on x. So let me call um, this by tj, and let me define so tn as the minimum over all this tjn. And this will be um, the minimum time you need in order to visit one other irreducible class if you started from uh, some irreducible class. And so by defining theta n in this way, we could prove So with that definition of theta n, and recall uh, I'm defining this phi n from v to uh, the set 1m, which I will represent by s, which will send x to uh, x in vj, or sorry, maybe let me add 0 to that. So what I'm saying is that, uh, let me represent by phi n this projection. So if x belongs to vj, I will send x to j. And if x does not belong to the union of vj, which means that if x is a transient point for Markov chain xt, and x will be sent to 0. Okay. So uh, if you wish, phi n of x is equal to the sum from 1 to m j chi vj of x, where chi vj is just the uh, indicator function of the set vj. Mind that if x does not belong to any of these vj, this sum is equal to 0, which means that indeed x is sent to 0 if it doesn't belong to one of these closely reducible class. And what uh, one can prove is that if you take this projection, and if you observe your Markov chain at time theta n, then this will converge to a Markov chain zt. So this is a Markov chain, which is uh, s-valued. So it doesn't take the uh, value 0, and which is, in our example, will be to, um, of course, here, the state space depends on n, but essentially with the same techniques, when, uh, you could prove that um, fn phi n x and t will converge to zt, which is a process in 1, 7. And in this process, you can observe, of course, that the point 3, which is, uh, no, sorry, the point 7 and the point 6 and point 2 are absorbing points for this Markov chain ZT. So in this example, all three dimensionals, if I'm looking at time, sorry, theta n, where theta n is n square log n, in this example, the points uh, again, the points 2, 6, and 7 are absorbing points of this Markov chain, while the other ones will be transient points. So this is um, one first observation. Then the second observation is that, well, this is a Markov chain. So let me represent by J. 
the large deviation rate function associated to zt. So j, it's now a functional on the measures on s. And if omega, it's a measure, a probability measure on s, let me define by j of omega the supremum over all functions h, which are strictly positive, of minus lh divided by h d omega, where now l is the generator associated to z. And with that, uh, we can prove that theta n converge to uh, i, let me call it 1 of mu, where i 1 of mu will be equal. Well, you see that what we had before, it's that i n of mu, what's converging to i of mu. Okay? And i of mu was equal to 0 if and only if mu it's a convex combination of the stationary states pi j. So this means that if mu is different from this convex combination, i of mu is strictly positive. So i n of mu is converging to i of mu. And if, therefore, if I multiply that by theta n for a sequence which is increasing to plus infinity, this is converging to plus infinity. So i of 1 is plus infinity. If mu is not a convex combination, of the measures pi j, while if mu it's a convex combination, this will be equal to j of omega if mu it's equal to omega j pi j. Okay, so that gives you um, the first result. So the first time scale in which you have a non-trivial uh, behavior. So if you multiply i n by these minimal transition time, you get a non-trivial convergence. But now you can, you can proceed. Okay. So we have here these m sets v1, v2. And our process, zt, it's a process which takes value in 1 to m. It may happen that zt has only one closed irreducible class, in which case there exists only one stationary state. And your analysis ends because, well, j of mu will be strictly positive or will be equal to 0 if and only if mu eats that stationary state. But it might happen that zt has more than one irreducible class. So let me represent that by r1 and up to rp. These are the irreducible classes of this Markov chain. Uh, ZT and T1 will be the transient points of this um, Markov chain. This means that if now I take V1, V uh, N1, so 1 and 1 will be the points in this first irreducible class. What in fact I have is that I'm starting to form a tree. So this is the second irreducible class, and so on uh, up to the last one, which will be the pth and v1 up. So here I have m, and here m minus and p plus 1. So let me represent these irreducible class. They have let's say, stationary states m1 up to mp. And this means that if omega it's a convex combination of these measures,
then j of omega, it's equal to 0, which means that you still have many stationary states, many measures mu, for which i1 of mu is equal to 0. Okay? And now you have to repeat. So let me call this uh, the second level, or v2, 1, up to v2, um, how many mp? p. Right, so these are the uh, irreducible class of my chain ZT. So I form with that taking all points in R1, which, are, which is the first irreducible class. And I'm taking the union of these sets. I get a new set, which, uh, so this is an irreducible class of Z, which is um, associated to it as a measure. And therefore, I form the sets V21 up to V2P by taking the union of these sets Vj for j in uh, each irreducible class. And what I just said is that, well, if now W is a convex combination of these measures, this means that j of W is equal to 0. And so mind, mu was the measure Wj pi j for j from 1 up to m. But now I'm assuming that w is given by this. So wj is actually the sum from 1 to p a k m k g of pi j, and therefore, if I take, if I change the odd of summation, and I call these measures, which are um, average of these measures pi j, the pi 2 k, what I get is that i1 of mu is equal to 0 if mu is a convex combination of these measures. And you can therefore repeat and now obtain, define the transition time. Uh, so the time it takes for your process starting from one of these uh, sets to visit another set, this will define a second time scale, which in our example if I come back here to this example, that would represent the time scale n to the power 3. This is a time scale in which you need to go from one of these three-dimensional cubes to another three-dimensional cube. And so in a general uh, model, what you need is to define these transition times and show that this second transition time is of order of magnitude much larger than the first transition time and repeat the analysis for this um, transition time. And from that, we can finally state so the theorem. So we proved so the theorem states that uh, there exists so remember, I have a set V. This is x and t, a sequence of Markov chain. I'll assume that these chains are irreducible, and plus a technical condition on the jump rates r and x, y, which I don't want to, to state because it, uh, it's technical. You don't need to, to know it to understand uh, the statement of the theorem. And the statement of the theorem is that there exists some scales, theta n1, which is much smaller than up to theta qn. And there exist um, measures pi 
p1 up to pi p, let's say mp, for p between 1 and q, such that if I take pn, in, when you speak about large deviation rate function, the natural convergence, it's the gamma convergence, so that this sequence of uh, rate functions, the gamma converge to IP. IP, so together with that, I have also this uh, Markov chain Z T1 up to Z T P, where Z T Q, where Z P T, it's a SP valued Markov chain, where SP or, um, is the set 1 and P, which corresponds to uh, the number of sets existing at the uh, generation P. So the first theorem tells you that you have this gamma convergence, I of P. I of P is exactly the large deviation rate function of the Markov chain ZTP. So I constructed ZT1. And what I'm saying, and I don't have time here to explain, it's that you can apply an induction argument to construct step by step this uh, Markov chain ZTP. So this is the first convergence. And now, what I want to say is that these large deviation rate function, they uh, characterize completely the metastable behavior of the Markov chain X and T. In which sense? Well, it follows from this convergence that I can write I and T, I n, as I1 plus P from 1 to Q, 1 theta P n, I P. Well, this is exactly uh, what this converging is telling me, is that I have an expansion of the large deviation rate functions in terms of these uh, large deviation rate functions. That the weights are exactly the weights for which So remember, I have these phi p n, which are from v to s p, which is equal to 1 n p. And what we have is that these phi n p of the process x n t theta n converge to z t p. So the weights that appear in the expansion correspond exactly to the time scales at which we observe a metastable behavior of our sequence of processes. It is in these time scales in which the projection converge to uh, Markov chains. I don't, I don't know if Sorry? But you can hear me. I don't know if Sorry? I, uh, I, I want to ask a question. I don't know who can hear me. No, but maybe you just plug it. It's Taliyan. Taliyan. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so, so you're talking about these various time scales, but in the examples you gave, you have only two time scales. Two time scales, right? Okay. So, 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 so you can have p time scales if d can have more than two values or something like that. If d, yeah, exactly. If okay. in my example I could have as many time scales as I wish, just by plugging d dimensionals. Okay cubes. Okay. And what I'm saying is that if you now fix uh, a set, fix a sequence of Markov chains for which these uh, jump rates not only converge but satisfy an extra condition, that you can find that there are exactly Q time scales at which you observe at each time scale a different behavior. So the application goes beyond 
uh, the example you, 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 you yes but there is a difference here it's that in this theorem v it's fixed while in that example for each n I had a different time uh, space so the, the space would also depend on n in my example while here it's fixed okay But uh, yes, I'm saying that you can find p different uh, q different time scales, and for which times for at each time scale you will observe a, what I would say a reduced um, evolution, because your whole process is described by a process in a much smaller state space. Okay. Now a case seven points and then three points, and if you had more dimensions less and less points. Okay. okay. So this is um, one result. This is a, a second result, the expansion. But what I want to point out is that when you perform this expansion, all the informations of the all the metastable informations are present. The weights represent exactly the time scales. And now, if you take the zero level sets of i p minus 1, so these are uh, what I call pi minus 1, uh, 1 up to pi p minus 1 and p minus 1. The zero level sets of, um, actually, these are p, sorry, are exactly the metastable states. Why I'm calling that metastable states? Because you can prove the following fact it's that if you take your process, you start your process at x, you consider it at time at this scale theta n, and you look at what is the probability that it is at y, you send t to n to infinity, this will converge to the following sum. I take a sum from um, j equal to 1 up to np. So there is a a x j, then a sum for k in uh, sp, which is the set 1 and p of p, t, j, k. And here is pi, k, uh, y, p. So this is telling me that uh, if I look at the process in the time scale theta p n, the probability that you are at y at this time, microscopic time t starting from x, it's actually a combination of these measures. What is this combination? This A, X, J, computes what is the probability that you will, starting from X, you will hit the set J before any other set. Right, so you have at level p, you have np sets, v1 up to vnp. And this is computing, well, you start from x, what is the probability that you hit the union of these sets at j? Then you multiply that by the probability that your process Markov chain ztp starts from j and is at time t at k times the distribution, the state, so the metastable state, pi p k y. So these are the metastable states, because what this is telling you is that uh, the distribution at this time t is actually a convex combination of these states. And what are these states? They are exactly the zero level sets of i p minus 1. So the zero level sets of IP give you the metastable states of um, 
your uh, metastable well, your limiting convergence ZTP. In the sum over K, do you, ha you can have several positive terms here? Yeah, sure, because ZT, it's a Markov chain in SP. So, uh, well, they have. The, the, the supports of the PK they are not disjoint. The supports of PK are di disjoint. Okay, so you have only one term which is positive. Right? If you fix ah, y, for y, for y, yeah, for y, if I fix y, there is only one which is positive. Okay. But maybe you should ah, okay. understand this as what is the distribution, okay. and the distribution it's okay. a sum of these distributions. Okay. And therefore. Um, and this is why I'm calling them metastable state, which means that, well, at any time t, the distribution, it's a convex combination of these states. So may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So your metastable state is actually a subset plus a measure on that subset. Yeah, metastable state, it's a measure. And the support of this measure, it's a set. And these sets are disjoint. Perfect. Thank you. But these are measures with disjoint support. And this is what I'm calling the metastable states. And they give you the distribution of your process. OK, so, okay, so this is the theorem. Right? You have um, this description of your process. Mind that if um, I take the support of these measures pi k, I take the, the union. The union is not the set V, but a much smaller set. And at each level, it's a smaller and a smaller set. My um, so let me comment on this uh, theorem to conclude is that. The important observation is that if you are able, so this is an absolutely general problem, right? You prove large deviations, you have a large deviation rate function, and then you want to describe your large deviation rate function. So it's a, this is a natural problem in uh, the theory of um, okay, in analysis or in probability. You have a functional, and you want to describe this functional. You, you want an expansion of this functional. What I'm saying is that, well, the expansion of this large deviation rate function gives you actually a description of the uh, metastable behavior of your process. The weights indicate the uh, time scales, and the level sets indicate the metastable states. This theorem has been proven in a very special situation in which the state space is fixed. So I considered a fixed state space and a sequence of Markov chain in that fixed state space. Of course, you expect. Uh, this result to be uh, of general validity. So it will be natural to consider now V as, let's say, a random walk in a potential field or the model I presented in which the state space depends on N. And I'm sure that such a result uh, should hold in, uh, for these models. You take, I don't know, the, let's say, the Ising model with an external, poten an external field, and you, well, you want to describe the metastable behavior of this object when the, let's say in two dimension, when the square uh, depends on the inverse of the temperature. I also, uh, I'm sure that such a result should hold for, uh, for such a model or for the other models uh, in statistical mechanics. And then a third observation is that here we never use the fact that the process is uh, um, reversible. So reversibility here uh, doesn't play any role. And I expect it not to, to play. If um, the process is reversible, you have explicit formulas for the rate function. So you see here I presented one which is a variational one. So you have to play with this variational formula. In the case of reversible systems, you have a much simpler uh, form of your large deviation rate function. And uh, that simplifies a bit the proofs. But as you have seen here, it has never been used. And therefore, I guess that this result is also valid wi without this condition. And I think uh, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.
So, so we should be, now be open to questions. Ciao, io Paolo Pia. Ciao, Paolo. Uh, thank you very much for the, your talk. Uh, very nice. Uh, I, I wonder if, I, if you could give uh, an example of a finite state space uh, with these uh, properties. Oh, yeah, any anyone you can think of. So let's say I just mentioned you take the Ising model and you take uh, you have an external uh, field in a finite fixed box, and this will be uh, this will satisfy. Essentially, all, all models from me statistical mechanics that you, in which you proved uh, the metastability uh, fit in these uh, in this hypothesis. If I wish, I, I can tell you the hypothesis. It's um, what I need is that if you take any if you take any sequence of edges x i y i. And if I divide that by the same numbers, so a similar product of Rm xi prime yi prime, that this has to converge either to zero to plus infinity or to some constant. So I just don't want, so this has to hold for any p and for any sequences of edges. And when you have these uh, statistical mechanics models, these are given by exponentials and you can easily check that this condition holds. Okay, okay. understood, thank you. Thanks. Any other question? Yeah, maybe I could ask a question. Nice, nice talk to Claudio. Um, Thanks. The, the transient states, uh, so they don't appear at all. <laughs> They don't appear at all, exactly. They disappear in this description. So if you go <coughs> this description uh, in which you have this convergence, ZT takes value only on the recurrent points. And the recurrent points at each uh, level are less and less, uh, are, yeah, fewer and fewer. So it means that, well, if you observe your process in a uh, long time, you won't see the transient points, because you don't spend enough time in at the transient points in order to see them. I see. So th there could be a, a time scale where you see them or something. Right. Well, if you, take, uh, okay, if you take the first time scale, so you take theta n equal to 1, uh, if you take t very long, then you, I mean, there is a probability that you see them, but this probability is uh, converging to zero. And what you, okay, so at the second time scale, there are also some recurrent points, but that also disappear, just because you don't stay enough time. You stay much more time in these wells which are deeper than uh, that one. So what you're doing here, it's you're decomposing old wells in the shallow wells, the second shallow, third shallows, and in this time scale in which you need to go from one third shallow to a third shallow, you won't see the two shallows because, well, they just, uh, they're not uh, deep enough to be there for a long time. Okay, thank, thank you so much, very much. Thank you. So, any more questions from, from the chat? Can I ask a question? Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. 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 Go on. Uh, I was wondering, um, do you have a simple expression also that you can um, for the um, for the theta ends in terms of the limits of the R, of the R, R limits, uh, or it's something that uh, you need to view with this uh, hitting time? So. No. Okay. So the theta ends are defined recursively. And they are expressed in terms of capacities. Mm -hmm. So let's say the first one, 1 theta n1, 
will be the sum from uh, j1 up to n1 of uh, 1 over the capacities between the set vj and the union of vk and pi n vj. OK, so uh, this formula express these, uh, the time scales in terms of capacities, because the capacities express the times, the transition times. And OK, so this gives you the first time scale. This time scale then defines a Markov chain, a reduced Markov chain. And now we have to look at the uh, irreducible class of this Markov chain to define the new sets V. And then this same formula for the new sets V will give you the second time scale. So uh, there is a recurrence. Well, these times scales are defined uh, recursively. OK, OK. Thanks. So any other question? Maybe from the audience at, uh, at IMPA? No questions here. OK. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, thank Claudio for this uh, beautiful talk. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, Claudio. Yeah, bye.